This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Joyful Wisdom by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Book Third 108 New Struggles After Buddha was dead, people showed his shadow for centuries afterwards in a cave, an immense frightful shadow. God is dead. But, as the human race is constituted, there will perhaps be caves for millenniums yet, in which people will show his shadow, and we, we still have to overcome his shadow. 111. Origin of the Logical Where has logic originated in men's heads? Undoubtedly out of the illogical the domain of which must originally have been immense. But numberless beings who reasoned otherwise than we do at present perished, albeit that they may have come nearer to the truth than we. Whoever, for example, could not discern the quote, like unquote, often enough with regard to food and with regard to animals dangerous to him, Whoever, therefore, deduced too slowly, or was too circumspect in his deductions, had smaller probability of survival than he who, in all similar things, immediately divined the equality. The prepondering inclination, however, to deal with the similar as equal, an illogical inclination, for there is nothing equal in itself, first created the whole basis of logic. It was just so, paren, in order that the conception of substance might originate, this being indispensable to logic, although in the strictest sense nothing actually corresponds to it, end paren, that for a long period the changing process in things had to be overlooked, and remained unperceived. The beings not seeing correctly had the advantage over those who saw everything quote, in flux. Unquote. In itself, every high degree of circumspection in conclusions, every sceptical inclination, is a great danger to life. No living being would have been preserved unless the contrary inclination, to affirm rather than suspend judgment, to mistake and fabricate rather than wait, to assent rather than deny, to decide rather than be in the right, had been cultivated with extraordinary assiduity. The course of logical thought and reasoning in our modern brains corresponds to a process and struggles of impulses in which singly and in themselves are all very illogical and unjust. We experience usually only the result of the struggle. So rapidly and secretly does this primitive mechanism now operate in us. 120. Health of the soul. The favorite medico-moral formula, paren, whose originator was Ariston of Kynos, end paren, virtue is the health of the soul would, at least in order to be used, have to be altered to this. Thy virtue is the health of thy soul. For there is no such thing as health in itself, and all attempts to define a thing in that way have lamentably failed. It is necessary to know thy aim, thy horizons, thy powers, thy impulses, thy errors, and especially the ideals and fantasies of thy soul, in order to determine what health implies even for thy body. There are consequently innumerable kinds of physical health, and the more one again permits the unique and unparalleled to raise its head, the more one unlearns the dogma of the quote, equality of men, unquote, so much the more also must the conception of a normal health, together with a normal diet, and a normal course of disease be abrogated by our physicians, and then only would it be time to turn our thoughts to the health and disease of the soul, and make the special virtue of everyone consist in its health, but to be sure 
what appeared as health in one person might appear as contrary to the health in another. In the end, the great question might still remain open, whether we could do without sickness, even for the development of our virtue, and whether our thirst for knowledge and self-knowledge would not especially need the sickly soul as well as the sound one. In short, whether the mere will to health is not a prejudice, a cowardice, and perhaps an instance of the subtlest barbarism and unprogressiveness? One hundred and twenty one. Life no argument. We have arranged for ourselves a world in which we can live by the postulating of bodies, lines, surfaces, causes, and effects, motion and rest, form and content. Without these articles of faith, no one could manage to live at present. But for all that they are still unproved, life is no argument. Error might be among the conditions of life. 1, 2, 3. Knowledge more than a means. Also, without this passion, I refer to the passion for knowledge, science would be furthered. Science has hitherto increased and grown up without it. The good faith in science, the prejudice in its favour, by which states are at present dominated, paren, it was even the church formerly, end paren, rests fundamentally on the fact that the absolute inclination and impulse has so rarely revealed itself in it, and that science is regarded not as a passion, but as a condition and an, quote, ethos, unquote. Indeed, amor placier of knowledge, paren, curiosity, end paren, often enough suffices, amor vanity suffices, and habituation to it, with the afterthought of obtaining honour and bread. It even suffices for many that they do not know what to do with a surplus of leisure, except to continue reading, collecting, arranging, observing and narrating. Their, quote, scientific impulse, unquote, is their ennui. Pope Louis X once, paren, in the brief to Beroeldus, in paren, sang the praise of science. He designated it as the finest ornament and the greatest pride of our life, a noble employment in happiness and in misfortune. Without it, he says, finally, all human undertakings would be without a firm basis. Even with it, they are still sufficiently mutable and insecure. But this rather sceptical pope, like all other ecclesiastical panegyrists of science, suppressed his ultimate judgment concerning it. If one may deduce from his words what is remarkable enough for such a lover of art that he places his science above art, it is after all, however, only from politeness that he omits to speak of that which he places high above all science, the, quote, revealed truth, unquote, and the, quote, eternal salvation of the soul, unquote. What are ornaments, pride, entertainment, and security of life to him in comparison thereto? Quote, science is something of secondary rank, nothing ultimate or unconditional, no object of passion. End quote. This judgment was kept back in Leo's soul, the truly Christian judgment concerning science. In antiquity, its dignity and appreciation were lessened by the fact that, even among its most eager disciples, the striving after virtue stood foremost, and that people thought they had given the highest praise to knowledge when they celebrated it as the best means to virtue. It is something new in history that knowledge claims to be more than a means. One, two, four. In the horizon of the infinite, we have left the land and have gone aboard ship. We have broken down the bridge behind us, nay more, 
the land behind us well little ship look out besides thee is the ocean it is true it does not always roar and sometimes it spreads out like silk and gold and a gentle reverie but times will come when thou wilt feel that it is infinite and that there is nothing more frightful than infinity oh the poor bird that felt itself free and now strikes against the walls of this cage alas if homesickness for the land should attack thee as if there had been more freedom there and there is no quote, land unquote, any longer 125 the madman have you ever heard of the madman who on a bright morning lighted a lantern and ran into the market-place calling out unceasingly i seek god i seek god as there were many people standing about who did not believe in god he caused a great deal of amusement why is he lost said one has he strayed away like a child said another or does he keep himself hidden is he afraid of us has he taken a sea voyage has he emigrated the people cried out laughingly all in a hubbub the insane man jumped into their midst and transfixed them with his glances where has god gone he called out i mean to tell you we have killed him you and i we are all his murderers but how have we done it how are we able to drink up the sea who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon what did we do when we loosened this earth from its sun whether does it now move whether do we move away from all suns do we not dash on unceasingly backwards sideways forwards in all directions is there still an above and below do we not stray as through an infinite nothingness does not empty space breathe upon us has it not become colder does not night come on continually darker and darker shall we not have to light lanterns in the morning do we not hear the noise of the grave diggers who are burying god do we not smell the divine putrefaction for even gods putrefy god is dead god remains dead and we have killed him how shall we console ourselves the most murderous of all murderers the holiest and the mightiest that the world has hitherto possessed has bled to death under our knife who will wipe the blood from us with what water shall we cleanse ourselves what lustrums what sacred games shall we have to devise is not the magnitude of this deed too great for us shall we not ourselves have to become gods merely to seem worthy of it there never was a greater event on account of it all who are born after us belong to our higher history than any history hitherto Here the madman was silent, and looked again at his hearers. They were also silent, and looked at him in surprise. At last he threw down his lantern on the ground, so it broke in pieces and was extinguished. I come too early, he then said. I am not yet at the right time. This prodigious event is still on its way, and is travelling. It has not yet reached men's ears lightning and thunder need time the light of the stars needs time deeds need time even after they are done to be seen and heard this deed is as yet further from them than the furthest stars and yet they have done it it is further stated that the madman made his way into different churches on the same day and there intoned his requiem atrianum dio when led out and called to account he always gave the reply 
what are these churches now if they are not the tombs and monuments of god one two seven after effect of the most ancient religiousness the thoughtless man thinks that the will is the only thing that operates that willing is something simple manifestly given underived and comprehensible in itself he is convinced that when he does anything for example when he delivers a blow it is he who strikes and he has struck because he willed to strike he does not notice anything of a problem therein but the feeling of willing suffices to him not only for the acceptance of cause and effect but also for the belief that he understands their relationship of the mechanism of the occurrence and of the manifold subtle operations that must be performed in order that the blow may result and likewise of the incapacity of the will in itself to affect even the smallest part of those operations he knows nothing the will is to him a magically operating force the belief in the will as the cause of effects is the belief in magically operating forces in fact whenever he saw anything happen man originally believed in a will as cause and in personally willing beings operating in the background the conception of mechanism was very remote from him because however man for immense periods of time believed only in persons paren, and not in matter forces things etc end paren. the belief in cause and effect has become a fundamental belief with him which he applies everywhere when anything happens and even still uses instinctively as a piece of atavism of remotest origin the propositions quote, no effect without a cause unquote, and quote, every effect again implies a cause unquote, appear as generalization of several less general propositions quote, where there is operation there has been willing unquote. Quote, operating is only possible on willing beings unquote. Quote, there is never a pure resultless experience of activity but every experience involves stimulation of the will unquote, paren, to activity defense revenge or retaliation end paren. but in the primitive period of the human race the latter and the former propositions were identical the first were not generalizations of the second but the second were explanations of the first schopenhauer with his assumption that all that exists is something volitional has set a primitive mythology on the throne he seems never to have attempted an analysis of the will because he believed like everybody in the simplicity the immediateness of all volition while volition is in fact such a cleverly practiced mechanical process that it almost escapes the observing eye i set the following propositions against those of schopenhauer firstly in order that a will may arise an idea of pleasure and pain is necessary secondly that a vigorous excitation may be felt as pleasure or pain is the affair of the interpreting intellect which to be sure operates thereby for the most part unconsciously to us and one and the same excitation may be interpreted as pleasure or pain thirdly it is only in an intellectual being that there is pleasure displeasure and will the immense majority of organisms have nothing of the kind one two nine the conditions for god god himself cannot subsist without wise men said luther and with good reason but god can still less subsist without unwise men good luther did not say that one hundred and thirty the dangerous resolution the christian resolution to find the world ugly and bad 
has made the world ugly and bad. 131. Christianity and Suicide Christianity made use of the excessive longing for suicide at the time of its origin as a lever for its power. It left only two forms of suicide, invested them with the highest dignity and the highest hopes, and forbade all others in a dreadful manner. But martyrdom and the slow self-annihilation of the ascetic were permitted. 132. Against Christianity It is now no longer our reason, but our taste that decides against Christianity. 133. Axioms An unavoidable hypothesis on which mankind must always fall back again, is in the long run more powerful than the most firmly believed belief in something untrue, paren, like the Christian belief, end paren. In the long run, that means a hundred thousand years from now. 137. Spoken in Parable A Jesus Christ is only possible in a Jewish landscape. I mean in one over which the gloomy and sublime thundercloud of the angry Jehovah hung continually. Here only was the rare, sudden flashing of a single sunbeam through the dreadful, universal and continuous nocturnal day regarded as a miracle of, quote, love, unquote, as a beam of the most unmerited, quote, grace, unquote. Here only could Christ dream of his rainbow and celestial ladder on which God descended to man. Everywhere else the clear weather and the sun were considered the rule and the commonplace. 138. The Error of Christ The founder of Christianity thought there was nothing from which men suffered so much as from their sins. It was his error, the error of him who felt himself without sin, to whom experience was lacking in this respect. It was thus that his soul filled with that marvellous, fantastic pity which had reference to a trouble that even among his own people, the inventors of sin, was rarely a great trouble. But Christians understood subsequently how to do justice to their master, and how to sanctify his error into, quote, truth, unquote. 139. Colour of the Passions Natures such as the Apostle Paul have an evil eye for the passions. They learnt to know only the filthy, the distorting and the heart-breaking in them. Their ideal aim, therefore, is the annihilation of the passions. In the divine they see complete purification from passion. The Greeks, quite otherwise than Paul and the Jews, directed their ideal aim precisely to the passions, and loved, elevated, embellished, and deified them. In passion they evidently not only felt themselves happier, but also purer and diviner than otherwise. And now the Christians? Have they wished to become Jews in this respect? Have they perhaps become Jews? 140. Too Jewish. If God wanted to become an object of love, he would first of all have to forego judging and justice. A judge, and even a gracious judge, is no object of love. The founder of Christianity showed too little of the finer feelings in this respect, being a Jew. End of Book Third, Part One. Two hundred and eighty. Architecture for thinkers. An insight is needed, paren, and that probably very soon, en paren, 
as to what is specifically lacking in our great cities, namely, quiet, spacious, and widely extended places for reflection, places with long, lofty colonnades for bad weather, or for two sunny days, where no noise of wagons or of shouters would penetrate, and where a more refined propriety would prohibit loud braying even to the priests. Buildings and situations which, as a whole, would express the sublimity of self-communion and seclusion from the world. The time has passed when the church possessed the monopoly of reflection, when the vita contemplativa had always the first place to be the vita religiosa, and everything that the church has built expressed this thought. I know not how we could content ourselves with their structures, even if they were so divested of their ecclesiastical purposes. These structures speak a far too pathetic and too biased speech. As the house of God, and places of splendor for supernatural intercourse, for us godless ones to be able to think our thoughts in them. We want to have ourselves translated into stone and plant. We want to go for a walk in ourselves when we wander in these halls and gardens. Three hundred. Prelude to Science. Do you believe, then, that the sciences would have arisen and grown up if the sorcerers, alchemists, astrologers, and witches had not been their forerunners? Those who, with their promising and foreshadowing, had first to create a thirst, a hunger, and a taste for hidden and forbidden powers? Yea, that infinitely more had to be promised than could ever be fulfilled, in order that something might be fulfilled in the domain of knowledge. Perhaps the whole of religion also may appear to some distant age as an exercise and a prelude, in the manner as the prelude and preparation of science here exhibit themselves, though not at all practised and regarded as such. Perhaps religion may have been peculiar means for enabling individual men to enjoy but once the entire self-satisfaction of a god, and all his self-redeeming power. Indeed, one may ask, would man have learned at all to get on the tracks of hunger and thirst for himself, and to extract satiety and fullness out of himself, without that religious schooling and preliminary history? Had Prometheus first had to fancy that he had stolen the light, and he did penance for the theft, in order finally to discover that he had created the light, in that he had longed for the light, and that not only man, but also God, had been the work of his hand, and the clay of his hands, all mere creations of the Creator, just an illusion, the theft, the Caucasus, the vulture, and the whole tragic Promethea of all thinkers?' 